So last week I did an interview with Kennedy Hall, as many of you know, and thanks Kennedy again for doing that, which generated a lot of interest. I think that the uh, the comment to view ratio is quite high on that video, and I also received several email messages in the aftermath of it. And because of the amount of interest it generated, I thought I'd spend just a little more time discussing it on my channel, and obviously Kennedy and I weren't 100% aligned on everything that we discussed, but regardless of where you find yourself on this particular topic, I was deeply encouraged by the reaction of so many people who were saying something like how much they appreciated the the tone and the dialogue and and the, the charitableness of the entire interaction and it was such a profound reminder for me of the good that can come from these kinds of conversations with people that you don't fully agree with because it can teach you so so much. Obviously, you'll learn something about a perspective that you might not be all that familiar with, but if done well, it will also teach you a lot about your own beliefs. Because in preparing for and conducting these kinds of conversations, you and I should be doing a lot of self-examination, which I did. And one of the questions that arose for me in the aftermath of this conversation was, why do I remain unconvinced? And that turned my attention to questions of persuasion. What actually inspires someone to make a big change in their life, the kind that conversion to a new creed requires of them? And this is an incredibly important question for us to be exploring as Christians, because we are all called to evangelize, to participate in the mission of the church, which means we should be intensely interested in the art of persuasion. And so as I re-examine this question after after this conversation, a somewhat surprising answer occurred to me. In sharing my own reflections about this, it requires me to be fairly vulnerable, uh, which I would ask that you receive with some grace and care and not to try to jump all over and to exploit. because. I'm, I'm insecure as the next person. I'd like to brand and position myself as, as a robust intellectual and a pure thinker who's only ever motivated by the truth. But I realize that for me, just like everyone else, before I consider the intellectual side of a position, I have to want to be open to it. If I have decided beforehand that uh, I'm going to treat some creed or some exposition of a, of a system of thought with suspicion or even contempt, then it doesn't matter how coherent or how convincing it is, I will find reasons to dispute it. And at the end of the day, a strong motivator for why I'm not part of the SSPX community is because I don't want to be. And the reason I don't want to be is because I'm intensely satisfied with my own faith community. I've never felt a deeper sense of belonging in my life than I do right now with the people who compose my circle of friends and the people that I worship with on Sundays. And that's incredibly rare and therefore valuable. And in listening to Kennedy Hall tell his story, I think that that's true for him as well. He found a sense of belonging and alignment for himself, a rare sense, in an SSPX chapel in a time when it seemed like the broader church might have been failing him. And for me to consider abandoning what I have in my community, I'd have to be radically convinced, way beyond a shadow of a doubt, that my existing community, this great gift that God has apparently given to me, is orbiting around a counterfeit truth, which can only be fully resolved in an SSPX chapel. And this is, I can't emphasize how important I think this is, because something like this lies at the heart of every person's struggle with conversion. Becoming Catholic and pursuing the truth, it comes with a massive cost. You will inherit the hatred of the world, and you will lose friends and sometimes even family over it. And most people, understandably, need to be attracted to something before they'd be willing to pay that kind of a price. So for those of us who are charged with the responsibility of witnessing to the world, our first aim needs to be building up their affection, helping them want it. G.K. Chesterton, in a passage that I couldn't find and verify in time for me to sit down and publish this video, uh, therefore take this with a grain of salt, he said something like, the moment you stop hating the Catholic Church is the moment you will find yourself being attracted to it. And that requires us to have a lot more than just a creed that happens to be true. We have to have rich community life and cultural expressions that will draw them in and inspire them so that they will be confident that they're, they're inheriting a lot more than what they're sacrificing. And truth be told, at least where I live, the Catholic Church in the 21st century is terrible, just utterly hopeless on this point. 
I became Catholic in spite of how badly I didn't want to. I wanted the truth to reside in the Pentecostal church I was also attending because there were a thousand young adults meeting there every Sunday. But I became convinced that the theological arguments of the Catholic Church were stronger than Protestantism's. So instead, I was confirmed in a Catholic Church where approximately zero young adults were meeting on Sundays. And this is revealing to me of another principle, which is that we sense greater credibility in those who perform actions that go against their desires. Like you'll often hear people say that I did this thing even though I didn't want to. I did it in the name of what's good or, or what's true. And in saying that, it lends credibility to their story. Like the soldier who goes off to war and sacrifices himself for the good of others. We instinctively interpret that uh, as a good thing because it was a sacrifice and not something that he wanted to do. And I am quick to underscore this point when I tell my own conversion story to the Catholic Church because it was all about the truth, baby. And the truth was so convincing to me that not even my desires and my hopes to find it somewhere else could pull me away from my deep suspicion that this was true. But I think that's the exception to the rule. Most people will not make those kinds of sacrifices in the name of the truth. I've had real Holy Spirit led conversations with people where they're just conceding every point that I make. So eventually I arrive at the question, well, why is it then that you aren't lining up with me at mass on Sunday? And it's at that point that they just tend to fall back on the absolute lamest excuses. I remember one conversation with someone who said to me in reply to that question that he didn't want to look like a hypocrite because in the past he had publicly and harshly spoken out against Christianity that he'd be too embarrassed by the social fallout if he then converted to the Catholic Church or even just to Christianity in general. And that was his only reason. He basically admitted he agreed with all of the claims I was making, but that the risk of humiliation was enough to keep him away. For someone to convert to anything, let alone Christianity, you will be far more effective by tickling their wants and their desires first. If they want it, or if they're open to wanting it, they'll be way more open to the logical possibilities. If they don't want it, there's hardly anything that you can say to penetrate the prejudices and the excuses that they will erect. In my case, when it comes to the SSPX, I don't have that desire because I have so much where I am that I'm not terribly eager to sacrifice. So the only thing left would have to be the argument for the truth of the thing, and it would have to be a sure thing beyond a reasonable doubt. And if I'm being totally honest, I just don't think that it is. At the heart of the SSPX controversy, for me, is something I just can't get over. Because you can't say in one breath that someone is the supreme judge in all matters of morality and religion and governance, and then in the very next breath dispute some specific judgment that he makes. By disputing or disobeying some judgment that he does make in reality, you are conceding that he isn't or can't be that supreme judge. Even if you say otherwise, your actions speak way louder than any creedal confession does at that point. To act as though that's the case for me would be a denial of everything that I believe about the church. In a scenario in which I think one thing and the Pope solemnly judges and instructs otherwise, I have to go with the Pope on that, otherwise he's not the Vicar of Christ. And of course there are scenarios in which the Pope could theoretically instruct you to do something immoral, like say you're one of the Swiss guards and he tells you to go murder somebody that is is blackmailing him or something like that. In a scenario like that, yeah, you can refuse the, the authority of the Pope, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a scenario in which he makes a solemn statement about something and gives specific instructions for the whole church to observe or for something that affects the governance of the church. And to do otherwise, to disobey an explicit instruction or command of the Pope of that nature is a schismatic act. I I can't look over that definition that comes from St. Thomas or canon law anymore to make it say what I might want it to say. And it specifically says to refuse to submit to the Supreme Pontiff. That's the definition of schism. But so does that mean that people who attend SSPX chapels, are they schismatics? And frankly, I don't think that that's a simple yes or no question across the board. I know people who attend SSPX chapels and I wouldn't describe them as schismatics. I bet if the Holy Father gave them some specific instruction to them directly, 
they would follow it. They would listen. But of course, that's not how the church is governed. Um, instead, that instruction gets filtered down through the various structures of, and channels of the church, and then it be, can become less clear. I think those people that I know who attend SSPX chapels, uh, and even the ones that I don't know, are sincere disciples of the Lord doing their best to raise their families in dreadfully confusing times. Um, and the best that the church can do for them is if it wants unity, is be what it's supposed to be. Remain true to the faith, adhere to scripture and tradition and the Lord's own commands, and then live it so that the world around us is cultivated by that collision, producing true and authentic culture. If those in charge would do that, such an incredibly simple thing, those people that who find themselves marginalized or somewhat in canonically ambiguous situations, I think they would come running desperately into the open arms of the church and I would be side by side, shoulder to shoulder with them. And so if we want to point the finger, if we want to lay blame for divisions that exist in the church, I'm a lot less inclined to accuse people who attend an SSPX chapel than I am unfaithful bureaucrats cosplaying as bishops. I'm more inclined to accuse bishops and even popes if necessary who are complicit in sexual abuse. I'm more inclined to accuse explicitly heretical priests and bishops promoting an agenda of the world like what we're seeing in the German Synod. That should be our obvious priority rather than scapegoating and punishing traditionalist Catholics. Who knows, if we actually turned our attention where it belongs, we might find that people who just want the orthodox faith will be less inclined towards canonically ambiguous situations that appear more faithful to them than the church at large. Hey, thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you are able to support the work I'm doing, there are a couple of ways you can do that. By donating through my website or by joining my online community, The Reinforcements. Both can be done by visiting brianholdsworth.ca. The .ca because that's how we internet in Canada. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, thanks for watching.